Hello and welcome to the Creative Venture Podcast. My name is Mike Levine and this is the interview series where I'm talking to successful and aspiring creatives to better understand how they've achieved their success. In this episode, I'm chatting to Ben Molyneux, an entrepreneur, author and former professional photographer. We discuss how to better develop your intuition, getting clients and how to stay positive and motivated when things don't really go your way. So I really hope you can get some value from this. There's plenty more episodes like this on the way soon. So without further ado, welcome to the Creative Venture Podcast. Ben Molyneux, welcome. Hello. Thank you very much for taking part. Pleasure to be talking to you. I'm really excited about this one, actually. But um, I'm really intrigued to be talking to you because I suppose that your experience is so multifaceted. (laughs) I mean, we were talking just before we got rolling about you being an author, which is not something I was aware of at all. You know, former photographer, you identify as a creative um, and an entrepreneur as well. And I think being an entrepreneur is a really creative thing because you're having to create concepts, create businesses that haven't existed before. Mm. So give us a little context for people that might not be aware of how you've gone from being a photographer to an author and now Top and Marwe. I like really did cut my teeth in photography and learn how to run a business. Mm-hmm. I wanted to do something creative and I wanted to do something with people because I identified myself as a a people's person and I enjoyed building relationships and making making friends, you know, through the work I did. Um, I also also need challenge in life. Mm -hmm. And the thing with photography is you would turn up to do a shoot and you'd never know what to expect. Mm. I found myself... Uh, at the top of a crane above Oxford, photographing the roofs, you know, with a harness and everything. I've, I've photographed members of the royal family and, and photographed, you know, big catwalk shows. So many different things, and they all need a different set of skills and challenges. And mm-hmm. I think there was a part of that that I really enjoyed the challenge. But running uh, a business as a, as a photographer gave me a lot of freedom freedom to work out how I wanted to spend my time, but also freedom in that creative field. And I was able over over 20 years to pretty much try every aspect of professional photography and see what I really enjoyed doing. Um, and I learned a lot of skills around selling, uh, marketing, um, lead generation, because the thing with photography is running your own small business is you're actually doing photography for a very small amount of the time. Mm-hmm. The majority of the work you're doing is, is everything else. It's, it's your bookkeeping, it's your accountancy. Mm-hmm. It is getting out on the streets and meeting your clients, getting in touch with people, keeping the relationships going. There's just so much to it. Uh, the photography was a, a small aspect of running the business. So, what I'm really interested in is people talk about all of these incredible experiences they've had, you know, photographing the rooftops of Oxford and um, photographing the royal family and such. But for people that are listening that maybe want to follow a similar path to yours, being a photographer, being an entrepreneur, they think, oh, my goodness, well, I'm not photographing the rooftops of Oxford. I'm certainly not photographing the royal family. How, how do you get the skills to do that? Um, is, did these things come naturally to you or? Um, yeah. Tell me a bit about that. I think for me it was trial and error. Um, it was, I mean, the, uh, photography is so much easier now than it was when I started. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first started, it was film. And I used to hand develop my films mm-hmm. and print the photographs myself in the dark room. And there was so much that could go wrong from the moment you take a photograph to actually Absolutely. delivering. Yeah. When you're a young photographer and you're just starting out, money is a bit tight. So the films were so expensive back then. Mm. Uh, and the developing the films as well. Everything was on a budget. So yeah, you had yeah. to get it right because you couldn't see it. So you had to really learn. Um, and I think I think that process at the beginning of my career of um, working out how much money I could spend on film and processing... Mm-hmm. Help me hone the skills because if you got it wrong, 
you lost your client. Right. Um, <laughs> it's pretty serious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nowadays you can just snap off hundreds of photographs and, and there's no cost involved. Mm-hmm. And you can see if you've got it right or wrong. If you're photographing a wedding and the bride is walking down the aisle towards you, you've got three shots and you've got to bounce the light off of some kind of ceiling. And in a church, there's no ceiling there. So there was an awful lot of pressure. And, and you, I would find myself in these really high pressurized situations. And then time and time again, it would work, which would give you confidence. And you would learn the experience of what worked and what didn't. And you'd have to really pay attention when you didn't get it right to work out why it didn't work. Mm. And I think that's how I learned photography, through through books um, through friends teaching me and through trial and error. Yeah. And that's, that's really interesting. There's always sort of this debate is, you know, should you go to do an academic study of it? Should you go to university? Should you do this? And before we got rolling, you were telling me about you started doing a college course, but then having skipped the first year, you just went straight into the second. So t- tell us a little bit about that and maybe set the context around getting the skills on the job versus doing a traditional study of the course. Yeah. Well, I, I got a job in a portrait studio and, and really did learn how to take, how to pose people and, and so on, um, and how to build that rapport. And there was, there was bits of training behind the scenes on, on it. But it was actually after I'd left the studio and set my own business up as a photographer that I learned how to print my own photographs and develop my own films and worked out what's sold, basically. Because if you're, if you're photographing people and they don't like the images, they're not going to buy them. But then you'll learn which ones they like and which ones you don't. So you tailor, um, you tailor what you're doing to, to what, what people want. Mm-hmm. And I was able to, to learn a lot about photography in the early days. And then I, I, I took a break after I'd been doing it for a couple of years and decided while I was on the break to do a college course um, it was a two-year a level and yeah i i realized straight away that i was um i was you know i was at a level similar to the teachers if i'm honest with you and and after the first couple of weeks i was put up into the second year and then after after a month i was just said well ben you really don't need to be here why don't you just sit the exam and here's the coursework you need to do. And I was able to complete the two-year course in three months um, and got a t- top grade, which was very satisfying, I have to say. And it also freed up an awful lot of time that I needed to then go up and set the business again. So just take us back a little bit further. So how did you actually pick up a camera? How did you get started in photography? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I had spent three years working in a bank. Mm-hmm. That was my first job after leaving school. And I, I enjoyed it. I learned a lot of skills at the bank, but I didn't see it as a long-term future for me. Okay. So I decided to go traveling and spent time in Australia. And there is just the most amazing um, views and scenery there. And I came back with some beautiful images with a really terrible camera. But it was enough to whet my appetite in photography. My father had a friend that was interested in photography and he used to... Um, give me a little lesson every now and then on how to use an old film Pentax camera with a mm. light meter attached nice. and a little, um, a little uh, hand inside that you had to balance in the middle. The to, needles, yeah. yeah. The, needle, <laughs> the what viewfinder, what yeah. <laughs> so I'd started doing interesting creative photography as a hobby mm-hmm. around that time. So I was learning on the job I was learning as a hobby. And that's the great thing about photography is it's very rewarding once you start taking some great photographs. Yeah, marvellous. And what are you working on today? Because fast forward to the recent future, there's been the Oxfordshire Project, which is an amazing resource for business people, entrepreneurs, creatives in in Oxford. Um, And also Marwi, which is a, a new project as well. Yeah, very lucky to to be working on both of these projects. Um, So my day-to-day is is currently running the Oxfordshire Project and and we have a a network of about 150 entrepreneurs who we bring together. For the Oxfordshire Project, we put on over 160 events a year. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and they are highly supportive and inspirational spaces where we get great speakers come along and my job is to help the entrepreneurs connect with each other so the entrepreneurs support each other and I'm, I'm the link between them all you could say uh, Maui is all about personal development we've created a community where people come together and be inspired and help them to become a better version of themselves it really is life-changing and and the the word for both of them is community Mm -hmm. it's about belonging to a community of like-minded people whether that's entrepreneurs or people that are just passionate about personal development Mm. um i can see myself doing doing this for a long time to come so while we're on the topic of networking, there's an American entrepreneur called Jim Rohn who says you're the sum total of the five people that you spend the most time with. And at the time that got me thinking about who I was spending my time with and whether they were, say, supportive and positive or generally more negative personalities and thinkers. So I'm interested to know, firstly, why is networking so important? And is who you've been spending your time with something that's been important for you? It's changed, actually. Uh, before I started the network, those five people would have been people really aren't in my life now. And the five people I would spend the most time with now are people I've met through through networking. It gives you the opportunity to meet like-minded people mm-hmm. and build relationships. And, of course, we grow as we as we age. And we change, and the person that we are presently is very different from the person we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. And everyone does the same. So we all grow in different directions. So it's great to have the opportunity to meet people who are on a similar path to the one you're on um, and learn from them and be inspired by them. And, and you have the opportunity to help and inspire them along the way too. So one of the things that I'm starting to learn now from your story is that, you know, you have incredible people skills. Um, And I've definitely seen this demonstrated from your work with the Oxford Project and and in different encounters we've had. But you have an incredible way of talking and listening to people and and really understanding what they need. And and I'm interested to know, like, where did this skill come from? (laughs) Well, thank you. I'm flattered by that. Uh, Actually, it's a skill that I would like to get better at. Mm -hmm. I think listening is incredibly important. And when you are with somebody who truly listens and hears you, it makes you feel really special inside. Mm -hmm. And I've met people within the network who have made me feel a million dollars just because they really care about what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to connect with people. So when I'm in in a networking space, one thing I've learned is is to listen and ask questions and be interested. And it's not about me. It's about them. You know, people will be interested and ask me questions and I'm happy to be honest and share. And and one thing I always do is give an honest answer if a question comes. Mm -hmm doesn't really matter how uncomfortable that might be, but I, I like to share the truth of a, any situation. So you asked me, you know, how that came about. Actually, I've done an awful lot of work on myself. I've read an awful lot of personal development books, and I always keep an open mind to improving myself. Mm-hmm. And in a lot of those books, they have talked about making people feel special um, how to listen, um, how to build relationships, how to build respect. So it is something that I've worked on myself. And I do find myself talking to somebody and, and then I'll, in my mind, I'm thinking of something else. And I, I'll, you know, that, you know I'll, I'll check myself and say, stop, where are those thoughts coming from? Get back to where you are right now in this conversation because this moment won't come back. So if you have to think about some of those general skills that you've picked up and you've said, yes, I I acknowledge these things that I've read, that I've researched, that I've experienced are important. If someone wanted to follow your sort of career trajectory, they wanted to become a photographer, an entrepreneur, what sort of standout things would you say are are important that you've learned? Well, if you want to run your own business and become an entrepreneur, you need to have a lot of 
um, a lot of different skills because you need to be proactive. Mm. Um, you need to be brave and you need to have ambition and goals. You need to set yourself long-term goals and daily goals and short-term goals. You need to plan things out, but at the same time, you need to allow yourself space to be creative and dream. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to look after yourself because ultimately, if you are not rested, uh, if you're feeling stressed, you won't be able to achieve what you can potentially achieve. So you need to get yourself on a really strong platform so you're in a good place. Give yourself time and opportunity. You need to give yourself plenty of opportunity to be inspired, to come up with new ideas. And one of the biggest things is you need to have a team of people around you who are positive, mm. who understand the journey that you're on and can give you feedback. And you're not looking at feedback from people who are from a different perspective because feedback can be very negative and have um, a negative a outcome for you as well so if somebody tells you that you can't do this or it's going to be really hard but they may be coming from a place of their own fear um, their own limitations so if you can surround yourself by people who are doing what you want to do they will share advice, but they'll share inspiration for you. you they'll become your inspiration and you can see what's achievable. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned their fear. And this is something that I, I really want to delve into on this podcast. Because I think when you're starting out, you don't really have, um, you know, tons and tons of times that you've done things and they've been successful. For a lot of the people that I see as the audience are going to be, and definitely in my own experience, when you're doing things for the first time, it is incredibly scary because it's not confidence you need, which is you know that it, things are going to work because you've done them many, many times before, but you need courage to sort of be able to walk into the dark and say, look, I'm going to try this. I'm going to do my best. I know the theory, the craft and the rest. I'm just going to sort of make up as I go along. So on the topic of fear, how did you overcome fear? And can you give us any specific scenarios that spring to mind, perhaps times that you've had to expand your comfort zone and um, embracing courage and overcoming fear. Yeah, it's funny. This, this has changed for me I, as I've evolved. Um, my, my first real fear in business uh, was photographing weddings mm -hmm. because you knew you only had one, one go. And this, like I said, was before digital. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't know if you, you know, if you got it right. Um, there are lots of horror stories. And it was high pressurized situation with, with quite a lot of money involved as well. Mm -hmm. I always got very nervous photographing weddings, but I knew or I thought that fear would go away because it was such a challenging day. And, and you, you've got the weather that you're playing, you know, uh, that, that, that can jeopardize the day. You've got um, venues that were really unphotogenic. Um, you had clergy who were <laughs> not always helpful yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so much that could go wrong yeah <laughs> i managed to photograph about 70 weddings um without a complaint or a problem but after 70 they were still causing me as much stress and <laughs> nerves as is you know as they ever did right so i decided to stop because i do believe that some things um you don't need stress in your life, mm -hmm. but you should give yourself a go at something and see. Uh, there are a lot of people that make fantastic careers out being wedding photographers and, and they get used to it and they enjoy it and mm -hmm. it becomes their passion. I think also you've said that you've done maybe 70 weddings and some people will only do things maybe once, twice, and they think, ah, oh, I'm feeling quite stressed. I don't know if it's for me, but you know, just to put that out there that you said 70 plus weddings that you've done and then you decide maybe it's not for me. Yeah, you know what? People can be quite persuasive. That was what it was. I never actually marketed the fact that I did weddings, but okay. people didn't give me a choice, <laughs> if I'm honest with you. Marvellous. Once I'd become the family photographer, 
and they got to an age of of getting married. It was no Ben, you're going to do this, including my mother, mm -hmm. who okay. I actually <laughs> ended up saying no to, and she said, "No, you're going to do it." Um, so I ended up walking my mum down the aisle, doing the speeches. And taking the photographs. No way. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> I think that might have been the last one I did. <laughs> um, yeah. Changing it to a, another situation. Mm. Um, I, I I felt, and if I can use weakness in here as well as fear, because they, they are different. But one of my um, weaknesses was writing. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm dyslexic and left school at a young age and my level of writing wasn't very good. Right. But I did enjoy writing and I enjoyed telling stories. So I set myself the challenge of writing a novel and getting it published to push myself out of my comfort zone and really, really challenge myself. And it took me three years and I decided to use my entrepreneurial skills. So I, I got a lot of help. Mm -hmm. I wrote the story, but I got it edited. Mm. and edited again um, and eventually found a London publisher who, who took the book on. Um, and that for me was a fantastic, it was proving to myself that I could face my, what I envisaged as my weaknesses and turn it into a strength. Mm -hmm. um, but then the fear came when <laughs> I had to start promoting the book <laughs> and putting my author's hat on because it was a completely un it was a completely new area for mm -hmm. me and I was finding myself at book festivals <laughs> wow. and going to schools. Uh, I remember one one particular one, it was at the Chip in Norton Book Festival. I, I was invited to go and speak to a class of 15 children um, and I would have 15 minutes. So I hadn't really prepared because I can talk for 15 minutes on, <laughs> on my book quite easily. Yeah, yeah, it's something you know. Um but I was ushered into the auditorium and there were 150 people sat waiting for me with all oh. the teachers, the headmaster. Mm -hmm. and, um, I had an hour. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it just hadn't been uh, relayed to me. Um, so I had to fill an hour unprepared talking to 150 people. And that, you know, as soon as I realized what was happening... Mm. Well, that's difficult because that's fear in the moment almost as well. It's not yeah. like something, oh, I'm worried about this talk tomorrow, the next day. It's like it's literally been dropped on you. I, so. de I decided in the moment mm. that this would be a fantastic opportunity to learn. And if I could actually do this and pull it off, yeah. I'd be able to draw on that experience over and over again, which I have done since. So um, I winged it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And, you know, we did a lot of questions and answers, which I was very thankful for having a lot of people ask a lot of questions. But we, we, we got through and I was very pleased. And ever since then, if I'm, if I'm faced with a lot of people, I know that I've done that. So in the moment, I'm actually better than I am rehearsing when it comes to public speaking. And you're also a really highly motivated person. And if you don't mind me asking, one, one of the things that I'm also quite interested in is ev everyone's life is going to be a roller coaster. There's going to be some highs and there's going to be some lows. And I think one of the things that um, people like Brene Brown talks about is creatives are one of those unique groups of people that have to deal with failure and getting kicked down on a regular basis. Things don't work out. And that's their livelihood. That's everything that they've got so much riding on these projects. It's not just like, um, I don't know, some more trivial thing that may occur for someone that isn't a creative. So what I'm interested in now is how do you maintain motivation? And if you're not feeling so brilliant, something isn't going well, what are your strategies for, for dealing with that? Okay, well, that's a great question, by the way. <laughs> you're very good at this. <laughs> Thank you. I think I've built that in early on because if I wasn't motivated, I didn't get paid. Mm. I had to generate all my income from an early age. And how I did it was I would go on the streets with a photograph and I would just approach strangers no way. and say, I'm here in your area taking photographs. Um, you know, are you interested? And then I would follow that up with telesales. And, and photography 
portraiture is the type of thing that people want, but they never really get around to organizing it, mm. unless you're getting married or you've got a new baby. Yeah, yeah. So I had to um, stay in touch with my clients and, and phone them all the time. Um, and if I if I did make the time to call them, I would be rewarded with appointments. Mm. It was as simple as that. So I could earn as much money as I wanted to because I built up a database of 10,000 yeah. clients yeah, over yeah, the yeah. years. Yeah. And they were always there and they were always willing and open to me coming and taking out more photographs. Mm. So it was just a question of, if I take, if I make the phone calls, I'll get the work. Or if I go out and stand on the streets with a photograph, I'll get new clients. So it was, it was the financial, um, you know, you need money, so you, you, you do it that way. And you, once you've worked out how to generate that income, that was what instilled that in me in an early age. But there is another aspect of motivation is the need to be challenged in new areas mm. that I'm guessing is familiar with a lot of entrepreneurs because the idea of staying still in the same career, in the same space, um, doesn't excite me. Mm. But actually moving into new areas where I have to learn new skills and develop, it doesn't only excite me, I actually see it as an essential part of being fulfilled. Yeah. So I like the idea of starting something new, mm -hmm. developing it, making it, work making it better making it brilliant making it exceptional and then once i'm at that stage i then start looking for something else mm. i want to be able to maintain that as it is but move into somewhere else and uh, that's just part of my nature and that's just in me it's really interesting because I, mean, I do so much research on people's creative journeys and what figureheads in the industry are saying and um I think, I think that one of the things that I've heard and I very much heard resonating as you're talking there was, was that you have to be in love with the journey and you have to be in love with the process of doing it. It's mm. not like, oh, I love, I love seeing the photograph as the end result. It's you have to be involved with the process of creating. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's one thing that really jumped out there. But what I'm, I'm also interested to know is, I don't know, let's say someone's listening to this and they're, they're just in envy. They think, wow, you know, this guy's had a, a successful career as a creator. I'm just not in the right mental space to, to have that. And maybe they're feeling really demotivated. What, what would your advice be to someone that's, you know, struggling and they feel they haven't got the energy, they haven't got the motivation, but they have got the skills? It's all about happiness. Okay, that's the key word, happiness. Mm -hmm. Because if you have that black cloud over you, it's very f hard to think clearly. Now, if you can become happy and find what it is that makes you happy mm. and spend time doing the actions you need to become happy, that fog will clear away and your creativity will emerge. So let me give you an example. In my view, happiness um, is made up of purpose and pleasure. Mm -hmm. And as we go through our life's journey, we have different needs. So for me, as I've become older, purpose has become more important mm -hmm. than the pleasure aspect. But it can't all just be about gaining happiness through purpose. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've found a lot of happiness through purpose, through my job, through helping people succeed. Mm -hmm but also through my family life, through my children and, and raising them. Now, if we look at ourselves and say, are we happy? It's a great question to ask. Mm -hmm. What is it that makes us happy? Mm -hmm. Write that down. What is it that makes you happy? For me, traveling, spending time with loved ones, um, getting enough time to relax, reading, learning, challenging myself. Now, once you've identified what it is that makes you happy, why not schedule that in? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm happy when I'm with my best mate. I'm happy when I'm traveling overseas or, or I just take a day out. You know, a lot of it doesn't cost money mm. and you just need to schedule it in. And once you can find that you are creating that happiness, it will lift the gloom. Yeah. And your, your question was very much along the lines of, um, you know, they're feeling in a rut and they can't 
find the energy and motivation. Now, when you're happy, you're aligned with who you really are. And when you're aligned, your creativity and your intuition mm. flows. Yes. And once you connect your intuition and follow your intuition, it will only lead you to do things that are good for you. Yeah, and to where you need to be. Where you need to be. So happiness, love, and intuition, they're mm. all connected. And they're all really, really positive things. So follow your intuition. It, work out what it is that makes you happy. Make time to be happy. Make time to rest. Look after yourself. And then the ideas will just flow. You can make time for new ideas as well. Um, set yourself time. Go and be on your own in a coffee a coffee house. Have a coffee and just, just take a piece of paper and write down ideas that inspire you. Or go for a long walk in the country. Whatever it is that helps you align with who you are. It might be just talking about your ideas with somebody who's close to you, who's a good listener. Mm. That's remarkable. And um, I think there's so much truth in what you just said. And when it comes to actually getting a, uh, a routine or organizing things that are good for you in terms of maintaining your creativity, maintaining your, your, your mental state and being positive and stuff, I think for me, when I applied some of these things to my life, I didn't like the idea of managing it. It, it didn't It didn't seem right for me. But when I actually did that and I took the stigma away of, oh, well, you know, other people aren't organizing, you know, putting time aside to be happy and, and this sort of thing. For me, it was, it was such a valuable thing. And m maintaining time for you, rest time, maintaining time to be creative, time to just do nothing and be on your own is a really, really valuable thing. So I don't know if anyone's listening to this thinking, oh, for goodness sake, like I can't see myself doing that. Just try it because you may be surprised with the results. Can I add here that it's about understanding who you are and what makes you tick. Mm. And the better we understand ourselves and we're all different and what works for one person doesn't work for another. But the closer you understand yourself and you allow for yourself to um, take what you need, learn your lessons, uh, the easier life becomes. And that can take time as well. And I think, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I, I think for anyone that's starting out, I don't know if you'd prioritize this above the craft, but it, it is as important to make sure that you're getting this time aside to understand who you are. It's, it's probably the most important thing you mm. can ever do in your whole life. Yeah, yeah. For anyone as well, not just creatives, but especially for creatives, but for anyone, it's just a great set of life skills to have. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to be successful in life, you need to know who you are mm. and you need to be on the right path. So this brings me perfectly into the topic of self-care. And um, we've briefly touched on, you know, sleep and things like this. But I'm interested to know, do you have any sort of like routines or anything that you quite strictly stick to to make sure that you're managing in your high performance life? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to think so. I mean, it, it changes. It changes. I, I'm, I'm, I go to the gym at the moment and I go as often as I can. And if I am not too busy at work... And if I'm feeling, uh, having any colds or anything, mm -hmm. you know, I can go to the gym maybe three times a week. And I find that helps me a lot. Uh, I do a form of meditation that um, I find calms me and gives me more space in my head and helps me make better decisions. And I try and do that every day. Um, I enjoy cycling um, quite often we'll, we'll cycle the kids to school in the morning. So I've started the day with a bit of exercise on the school run. Uh, I mean, really enjoying the swimming at the moment. So nice. when I, there's a <laughs> pool at the, the gym. So I, I do a lot of swimming and, and cycling at the gym as well. Um, and I miss it when I don't. And stretching, I think uh, stretching for me, it, my body doesn't work as well if I don't stretch. Mm -hmm. So if you think about all those things that you've mentioned, if you miss a few of those off your list, you know, you, you miss a meditation or you don't get to the gym for maybe two, three weeks, would you say that you would feel worse? I think a couple of weeks is okay. Beyond that, um, that means I'm not fully aligned 
if I haven't got the time to go to the gym or I'm not able to find time to meditate, something has fallen out. I've given myself too much work or um, some, something's amiss. Mm. And that's mm. where I start questioning. And actually, it's, it's getting those habits and getting them in place uh, that help align me again. Yeah. And to just talk about meditation briefly, because this is something that I um, came across a few years back when I was studying and um, I was working with someone at the time that um, was quite keen on meditation and I thought I'd give it a go. And it's really created a lot of mental space for me. And I, I find it's a, a real benefit, actually, something I can't really do without. And and I know that, you know, in a lot of circles at the moment, people are talking about the benefits of meditation. But I'm interested to know, like, you know, f for you, what, what what does mindfulness mean? And is it something that you'd maybe recommend for people that are starting out and wanting to learn more about themselves and improve in their career? Okay, well, my journey is... Uh... You know, I got into um, meditation many years ago and, and for different reasons. It can help me relax. So if I'm stressed and feeling uptight and I've got some issues I'm working through, actually to go and meditate really, really helps de-stress me. It means I'm able to make better decisions. Um, I use it for visualizations. Mm-hmm. Um, to help with my goals. So you'll hear a lot of athletes and sportsmen will be visualizing themselves succeeding. Well, I, I believe in the law of attraction and I believe that if you spend time thinking about what it is mm. that you want to achieve and bring into your life, visualizations will help with that. Uh, I also feel that you can access a lot of your inner wisdom through meditation. So if I have questions or challenges that I'm facing, I will ask myself those questions through meditation and get a much wiser answer mm. than if I'm just responding without taking that time. Yeah, perfect. And um, if you have to think of some of the key points that have sort of led to your success... What do you think those would be? Uh, values, actually. Understanding my values and living a life aligned with those values. And um, people talk about values, and when you look into values, it's what's important to you. Now, if you can work out what's important to you in life and you can build a career that is fulfilling those values you will live a fulfilled life. So leaving values aside, I think security comes into play. You, you need to have enough money to feel safe enough to be able to be creative. The fact that I've been able to work in the creative industries for all of my career, mm. and I've been successful in all of the creative industries, I think is because I've always made sure there's been enough money coming in. And that sometimes means... You're in a creative industry, but you're not necessarily doing exactly what you want to do. Right. First of all, you've got to make sure you can pay the mortgage and yeah. look after the kids. Um, that comes first. Mm. And then I've left the growth and new things in the space that's available beyond providing for what I need to provide for. So security, values. Now, this is something that I've been doing for for the last maybe 10 years is following my intuition mm -hmm. 100%. Nice. nice. <laughs> now, that is a huge leap when mm. you start doing it. When you actually take time to listen to what your gut is telling you, even if common sense and logic is telling you to do something else. Mm. Um, so I, I took the decision and it changed my life. Uh, it took me away from a very, very successful photography business that I, I could have worked in for the rest of my career and been, you know, healthy and wealthy. Um, I turned my back on that because my intuition told me that's not where I was supposed to be. And, and, and when I made that decision, it changed my life. Uh, it was really scary at first, but I've learned to trust it and just go with it. And wherever the pieces fall, they fall. But 
it's always led me to a better place because I followed it. And for people that might want to sharpen that skill of being able to listen to their intuition, what would your advice be if uh, someone wants to sharpen that? It's practice. It, it's about doing it as often as you can. Mm. If, if, if you listen to your intuition once every six months, you're going to find it hard. Mm. <laughs> but if you actually do it every day... Yeah. And these can be little things, can't they? It can be, you know, do I reply to that email straight away or do I leave it? Or I, I want to make this phone call to do this thing and I'm not quite sure, you know, th there's so many little things you can start with. It doesn't have to be great leaps leaving a job as such, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, you, you can ask yourself what it is that your body wants to eat for lunch. Mm. <laughs> it will tell you. Yeah, it will tell you. Um, you can... Um, ask yourself, what should you do today? What should you truly do today? What is the best use of your time today? Yeah. And if you're sat quietly, things will start popping into your head. And if you think about those things, how does that make your body feel? Mm. Does that feel good? Or does that feel wrong? And you, you, you can, when you follow your intuition, it will point you. You're like, the, an idea will either feel good or it will feel wrong. Mm. Follow that. So while we're on the topic of things popping into your head, mm. um, comparison, I think, is something that a lot of creatives will encounter. Um, also probably emphasized by social media and the fact that there's so much good content that's shared online. And quite often you'll see, you know, people's Facebook pages, their Instagrams, their highlight reels, it's, it's their 20%. It just shows a tiny percentage of what their life is actually like and quite often leaves out all the failures and the things that go wrong. So um, I'm interested to know, have you ever struggled with comparison? And for people that are maybe comparing themselves, their everyday against someone's highlight reel, what, what would you say to them? That's a good question. I've not been asked that one before. I, I, I don't compare myself to anyone. I don't think I've ever have. Um, do you know why that is? Why have you, do you? I mean, do you see that as just being normal, or is that oh, okay, I've never actually done that. That's odd. Well, I've, I've had a, a lot of things I've wanted to achieve in my life, mm. and they've come from within, not from outside. So I'm not looking at what somebody else has done, and thought, oh, I want to do that. It's ideas that are coming up for myself. Mm. Um, so I've, I've followed my path. I try not to post anything negative ever on social media. Yeah. Because I feel that, the, you know, whatever we focus on will bring into our life. So if we focus on the negative aspects of our life, we'll bring more of that. And if we focus on the negative aspects of society, it inflames it. Uh, adds fuel to the fire. Absolutely. So I focus on positive aspects of life and I create my future from what comes from within me and my own inspiration. Um, I've never looked on envy with whatever people are doing. I never have done. Um, because even though in my mind um, I... Uh, don't have that many natural skills I know that I've got the power to learn and whatever I set my mind to learn I can actually get that being dyslexic I found it very difficult to learn languages um, but I was able to learn Spanish and found it very difficult to write but I was able to write a book a novel two novels um, that have been published you know for me it's about desire and determination and resilience and that's what I feel that I've got in, in abundance. And we can all have that if we dig deep enough for it. Mm. And if we've got that, it's, it's a bit like, I don't, I don't know if you follow football, but there are some football players that don't have the natural ability, but they make up through work ethic and they can have fantastic, successful careers because they're just so hard working. Well, we've all got that. We can all work hard. It's just building and developing that skill and we've we can learn new skills even if they're left hand skills to us we can learn them if we put our focus there so whatever you want to achieve you have to be humble enough to realize that you don't know it all to go and seek the information mm. but whatever it is whether it's photography whether it's to be an actor whatever it is go find somebody to to learn from 
and be open to learning whatever it is you need to learn and have that determination, that fire in your belly to get there. Don't be afraid to fail because failure is all about an opportunity to learn. What really interests me is I think that you've managed to really understand how you learn and apply yourself, whether it's writing books or it's learning another language or something like that. You really understand how you learn. And and, and for people that um, might have something that they feel is inhibiting them, like um, dyslexia, or they feel that they're a slow learner or something like that, I think being able to understand your learning style means you can almost do anything. So if I asked you, you know, do you understand how you learn? Is that, is that something that you'd say, yeah, you, you do? Yeah, I, I learn different ways to do different things. Yeah. Um, but there is a starting point. I, I enjoy reading and I find reading is a great way to learn because you can take your time. Mm. Uh, I really struggle uh, in a class setting mm-hmm. because my brain processes things quite slowly. And I'm quite slow to start something for the first time. So um, that could be a language. It could. I remember trying to ride a quad bike and it all just felt like it was back to front. And yeah. I ended up in a ditch. <laughs> um, learning to drive a car. Everything I've tried to do and learn, it takes me a little bit longer. But I do know that I will get there. If I persevere with it, I know I'll get there. You know, I, I, I passed my driving test at 17, but I failed that test three times before I got there. But it was that determination that I would do it mm-hmm. by a certain stage that, you know, I, I, I can make up for not having a, a natural ability to do things the first time. Uh, I did um, uh, Strictly Oxford nice. um, a couple <laughs> of years ago and dancing I found just as hard as all these other things trying to get my feet in a particular routine mm-hmm. it's just not how my brain works to get my feet in a particular order but you know I just made up by doing twice as much practice as everyone else and in the end you know got through the experience and thoroughly enjoyed it um languages I learned languages in three different ways it was almost like I needed to learn it in three different ways for it to stick. Mm -hmm. So that was um, by listening to audio tapes. Mm -hmm. It was by having a one-to-one teacher. Yeah, I couldn't do it in a class, but having a one-to-one teacher um, and being able to actually immerse myself in the language and speak it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and not be afraid to make mistakes, actually. Just just go with it and see if I could make myself understood. Um, writing, very different for me. I needed to put the hours in. I needed to put the hours in, but I also needed to know that it didn't need to be perfect because as an entrepreneur, I realized it was the storytelling that was important, not the quality of the writing. And actually, I could get, I could pay somebody to edit it and improve the quality of the writing. Um, And I thought, you know, there are aspects that I can outsource. When you run a business, you don't have to do your accounts. You can outsource that if you're not very good with numbers. Mm. So, you know, different things I learn in different ways. Public speaking, very much through failure. I started off feeling fairly natural. And then when it came to making a long speech completely messed it up and I realized there was a certain key elements have to come into play but I only learned that through trial and error Mm. so now if I'm doing say a 20 minute talk I need to write it down I need to practice 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 and then I need to just do it in the moment Mm. so I've got something to fall back on but actually I can't try and remember word for word i've just got to follow a story in my head when i'm speaking so i I learn it beforehand and then when actually deliver on the day is probably very different from what i've learned but that's just there in the back of my mind and that again is just trial and error And, and when you've done something taking time to evaluate let it soak in how did i do how could i have done better write it down, work it out, 
talk it through with people. How did I do? What do you think? Um, and take time to learn about how you can improve. Um, and don't look at it as failure or embarrassing. It's like that. It's a fantastic blueprint. What worked? What didn't? What did I do enough prep beforehand? Um, did I do too much prep beforehand? And you take that to your next talk. So different things for different things. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. You, you have such a high level of introspection. And, and I'm interested to know, is, is that something, you, have you always had that from a young age? Because if you take me back to, say, like starting as a freelance photographer in your early 20s, um, and then, you know, w even working before then, I mean, have, have you always had these skills? Because you seem to be able to really analyze exactly what you need. And I think that those, that is the sort of skill that I'm starting to notice in, in, in high performance people. It's interesting. I, I actually think that my dyslexia has been a really helpful aspect in my life. Yeah. I, I've read about dyslexia and it, people are very good at problem solving. Mm -hmm. So I look at problems and try and find the solutions. And I do that with my own performance. Actually, I don't aim for perfection. I aim for success and success and perfection aren't the same thing so it's to get good enough to do something that you can be successful not to be perfect at something because I think perfection can hold people back I think it can stop them from starting because they're trying to find the perfect formula or the write the perfect book or take the perfect photo, have the perfect business, but it stops them from actually going out there and doing it. I think, for me, I like to just put something out there and improve upon it and keep evolving and moving forward. The world is changing all the time. What was perfect in 2012 is probably moved on, in, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. There's, um, there's so much value in that, so thank, thank you for sharing that, Ben. That's awesome. So what I like to do just before we wrap up is do a quick fire round. So we won't spend as long on the questions, but it's just the first sort of thing that comes into your head. So my first question is, what advice would you give to your 25 year old self? Um, be brave, push your boundaries as far as you can. Um, spend more time reading and learning. What's the most valuable thing you've learned so far? It's about being happy, not about making money. And what's the most effective change that you've made to be proactive? Be part of a community of like-minded people because they inspire you. Keep you going. Keep you motivated. What are your thoughts for the future? I, I think I like to have a dream that can evolve and grow big and and take new routes and, and, and take new paths. Um, I, I would like to have an impact somewhere along the line to a better world. And I'm searching for something that can have as big an impact as possible with the um, skills I've got in, in the community we're building. So... Uh, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find something that can make a huge difference. And w I've realized that the biggest difference that we can make in, in the world is by inspiring the individual to be and do better. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the path that I'm on, trying to find a way that I can contribute to a better world. That's marvellous. And I guess very much implemented in the work that you're doing today. So if I hand the stage over to you, just tell people a little bit about what you're working on at the moment and where people can find you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if, if people are based in Oxfordshire and, and they're interested in um, growing their business or, or even finding out about if they can set up a business, uh, they can get in touch with the Oxfordshire Project. So that's oxfordshireproject.co.uk. It's masses of support there for, for local people. Maui is a personal development space where people come together to hear inspirational speakers, to be inspired, to share their experience and learn from others. We do this by meeting twice a month in the evenings 
and we form a community and people really get to know and trust each other. It's a confidential space. And then outside of each Maui group, we have a wider Maui community where we put on social events and bring like-minded people together. And that can be a, a walk or we're looking at climbing mountains together in the future. Uh, it's a fantastic space that attracts a certain type of person, somebody who's open to hearing new ideas, who has a growth mindset, who is not judgmental and likes meeting new people and, and feels the value in being part of an uplifting community. And yeah, I mean, if anyone's interested in finding out about my writing, I've got two novels out there, Arthur Archer and Time Traveller's Chronicles and Arthur Archer and the Warrior Queen. I would love uh, to have feedback on those if people take the time to read them. Marvellous. I'll be sure to check those out. Thank you. Well, Ben Molyneux, thank you very much for joining me and thank you for taking part. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I've had a great time. Hey there, guys. Thank you so much for listening. I really do want to make something here that can be valuable to people. So give me some feedback. You know, feedback of all kinds is super helpful. You can drop us a DM. We're at The Creative Venture on Instagram and Facebook. And if you do have time, if you could rate and review the show, especially on Apple Podcasts, that will really help us out and get the podcast seen. But anyway, for now, thanks again for listening. And we hope to see you again on the next Creative Venture podcast.